Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. On Monday next week, Missouri lawmakers will return from their spring break. For Missouri's Republicans, the agenda they're returning to is squarely focused on restricting the rights of transgender people. Among the bills being debated are those that would prohibit trans girls from playing girls' sports, ban gender-affirming health care for minors, and even restrict what teachers can say in their own classrooms about sexual orientation or gender. Republican lawmakers have vowed to return from that break to pass those laws. And here to talk about the legislature's focus on trans legislation and what might happen next week when lawmakers get back to work is St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent Jason Rosenbaum. Jason, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Now, first, I'd like to note that the subject we're talking about, the lives of trans people, is much more than a political issue. And in the coming days, you'll hear more trans people's voices, including trans youth and their families on our show. Jason, bring us up to speed on what the legislature will be doing next week. And uh, why are these bills targeting trans people so high on the agenda? Well, before lawmakers left for spring break, there was a lengthy debate on the Senate floor about a bill that would bar minors from accessing gender-affirming care. And what I mean by that is not only gender affirmation surgeries or gender reassignment surgeries, but also puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And the Democrats filibustered it. The legislature adjourned early. But the proponents of that bill have vowed to return to it when the legislature returns next week. And Um, Why has this risen to the top of the GOP agenda? I think that's a simple question with a lot of complicated answers. Uh, It's easy to just say that it's it's political and it's aimed at um, catering to a socially conservative base. Um, But I also think that this has become something that has spread to states with a similar political complexion to Missouri um, but interestingly, it, it seems to have hit a lot more serious roadblocks here than a state like Iowa or Idaho or even Florida. And what is that complexion? <laughs> Republican. Republican states. This has become a big Republican priority in states with Republican state governments. And I, 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 the reason why I don't want to just cast this as just a purely political thing is I do think that there are Republican legislators that see these type of issues and they, they want to do these things because they believe they're the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I want to just make that clear. But I think that there's definitely been a concerted effort to make it a political issue As evidence, when I went to Lincoln Days in Springfield, numerous Republican candidates were advocating restricting gender-affirming care for minors as well as um, barring transgender girls from playing girls' sports. So when it's Mm -hmm. talked about in political context by political candidates, it's a political issue. And a couple of the other bills pertain to um, something we mentioned at the top about educators and what they can say. Right. It's basically like some of these bills would only allow very specific people uh, to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity. And it's it's created a lot of scenarios where uh, State Representative Phil Cristofanelli, a Republican from St. Charles County who is openly gay, asked the sponsor, could you talk about Martha Washington in a classroom? Because by saying that uh, she's George Washington's wife, aren't you talking about sexual orientation there because they are a straight married couple? It also brings up the question is, what if Missouri elects an openly gay governor? Could we even say that under that certain circumstance? That bill seems to be running into a lot more opposition and seems to be less of a priority than the gender-affirming care bill. Mm -hmm. That seems to be at the top of mind for legislators at this point. 
There's a, a piece that you've written very recently, <clears throat> and in your latest reporting on this, you described the opposition to these bills, not just from Democratic members, but from trans people mm -hmm. who have shown up in numbers to testify against these bills. That includes Chelsea Friels, a junior at Clayton High School. Uh, I was born at the DePaul Hospital. They, the doctors identified me as a male, and that's how I lived the first uh, 12, 13 years of my life. Um, I started to realize something was off when, my, uh, when I started going into puberty. I started realizing that I did not want to live my life as a man. I, it's not that I could not, I, I didn't want to, to, but if you think about what the future was, for me as a man, there was no future. The future was six feet under. And when I realized that, and I was thinking about going there, I realized I didn't need to. And so that's why I, started, I, I came out. That's why I transitioned. That was Clayton High School junior Chelsea Friels testifying earlier this year in the Missouri legislature. The experiences of people like Chelsea uh, describing their transitions as a thing they needed to do to stay alive. Jason, is that having any impact on the Republican lawmakers who are pushing these bills? Uh, it's, it, re it remains to be seen. I mean, when you talk with some of these uh, families of, of trans children, and by the way, I just want to mention this may be too much of the sausage we made. I talked to Chelsea's family before including it in the story. Um, I think when you talk with these people, you it, of course it affects you from an interpersonal level. I think that there are some Republicans that it, it has no impact on. But I think that the big question about whether the legislation is just going to ban surgeries or whether it's going to ban everything will depend on if those types of voices have been convincing to Republican leadership. And that's kind of the lingering question. If the answer is yes, and it has affected them, then Missouri's restriction on gender affirming care may be a lot less restrictive than other states. And that would be seen as a big victory for LGBTQ activists mm -hmm. and their supporters. One of the other things that did come up, and I, I think this is sausage making worth mentioning, is that it took you several drafts. Yeah to get this last story right. I mean, what made it such a um, such a difficult thing? Well, I think when you're dealing with a traditionally marginalized community, like the transgender community, you want to make sure that you are getting the terminology right, that you are not falling into uh, tropes or stereotypes. Um, I, I not only uh, talked to a couple of members, like families of people that had cha uh, that uh, had transgender children, but you know, um, Shira Berkowitz is trans. They are with Promo. I spent a long time talking with them for this story, um, and I think that you need to just make sure when you're writing something like this that you are actually uh, making sure that you're thoroughly educating yourself about a subject that you're not personally involved with. And, you know, that's why it took so, took a long time. But, you know, sometimes it's good to have these hard types of stories because mm -hmm. you come out the other side learning a lot that you may not have known before. Mm -hmm. And that has public uh, benefit, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think that a lot of, like, heterosexual white male reporters should do this, you know, Um I've covered a lot of a lot of issues relating to abortion rights. I've covered a lot of issues related to um, the Ferguson uprising. I, I think it's important for people that look and look like me to go through these experiences, so they come out the other side knowing what it's like for people that aren't as privileged. Mm -hmm. And relevant to this, in that last report. You wrote that Republicans are looking at polling. Mm -hmm. uh, polling is not known for its nuance. No. Uh, and those polls show some voters are concerned about transgender issues. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of a, a big way to describe something that, that is very complicated. Is it polling that's driving these bills? So I was talking with Senator Greg Razor, who's a Democrat from Kansas City, and he does believe, like, for example, the gender affirming care ban is widely popular right now. 
Um, he even said it was like an 80-20 issue in favor of banning it for minors. What he told me is that he expects a similar pattern to occur with that as what happened with same-sex marriage. It's easy to memory hold this, but in 2004, a same-sex marriage ban in Missouri passed 70-30. And now I wouldn't say it's like 80-24, but, but attitudes on that have changed dramatically. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the point that he was trying to make. But people like Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican, and his political people would probably argue that the reason why these issues are being emphasized by Republicans is they're very popular amongst the Republican electorate right now, which is why lawmakers are getting so much correspondence from ordinary Republican voters to do these sort of things. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to just say that this is like a political action in a vacuum. I think it's happening because a lot of people who are Republican voters are generally energized about it, according to lawmakers themselves. And what's different this year? I mean, you did mention there have been other other bills um, that Republicans have tried to pass in the past. What is what's making it different right now? I think it's all. I think it's primarily because there's a lot of momentum in other Republican states. I want to make sure to to actually uh, say what that is. And I think that when you have the opportunity to pass something because of the political designation of a state, you want to take advantage of that. But unlike those states, Missouri has a tradition of having a Missouri Senate with a strong filibuster. That filibuster often forces compromise between competing sides. It looks like that what that may happen here. Um, But the big question is if the people that really want an all-encompassing gender-affirming care ban don't want to compromise and want to use procedural motions to kill that filibuster. I I don't think it's going to happen next week. If they do do that, use what's known as the previous question to end the filibuster on this bill, it would mean that Democrats could wreak havoc on everything else in the legislature, which is why it may be a bit anticlimactic next week that even if this comes up, there may not be a resolution. Mm-hmm. So you know, you've mentioned other Republican-dominated states, mm-hmm. but we're not too terribly far away from the next presidential election. Um, how is this issue playing out on the national stage? Well, I mentioned before that Senator Hawley is talking about this issue quite a bit in his political speeches. So it signals to me that he is going to use this as part of his re-election campaign. Now, if this issue didn't exist, I think most people would say that Holly is favored for re-election just because Missouri is just a very Republican state now. Mm-hmm. But given that Holly himself is expecting a very competitive re-election campaign because of, you know, his his association with the January 6th insurrection and him um, uh, objecting to uh, – Uh, Pennsylvania's electoral votes, um, I think he's trying to figure out ways to differentiate differentiate himself from his eventual Democratic opponent. We'll see how big of an issue this is, you know, 12, 18 months from now. There could be something completely different that supersedes it. Right now, it's just very top of mind in Missouri politics. Mm -hmm. And what happens, Jason, if the Democratic members do use the filibuster. What what are the possibilities? The the possibility is the bill doesn't pass um, unless they use the aforementioned filibuster killing motion known as the previous question. And what I think a lot of Democratic senators are hoping for is the filibuster facilitates some sort of compromise where something passes, but it would still allow transgender youth to access some forms um, and their main forms of gender affirming care. Which, which are primarily like puberty blockers and hormonal therapies. Mm-hmm. I think if there's a bill that's passed that bans those sort of things, a lot of families are incredibly worried about their future in this state because, in their view, they need access to that for their children. And I think a lot of families around the country where states are passing those things more successfully are kind of going through those motions in their in their head right now. Mm-hmm. And what are you going to be looking for um, come Monday and and reconvening occurs? I'm going to see if they go to this bill right away. 
I'm going to see if proponents of this bill try to end the Democratic filibuster. Um, and I, I'll be actually, if they actually try to do that, could other Republicans vote against ending the filibuster and wanting to continue negotiations um, until potentially the last day of session? I know this is a lot. I know this seems like inside baseball to a lot of people, but this really does matter for the end result of this bill. And this will really affect people's lives. So I think there's a a lot at stake here beyond just a political win or political loss, which Mm -hmm. is why I think a lot of people in Missouri uh, political world are watching closely. And the last question, are there things, Jason, that are not getting done in Jeff City because of this issue? Well, because they spent so much time on this bill before spring break, they haven't passed anything to make it uh, more uh, difficult to amend the Constitution. Um, they haven't passed anything out of the Senate dealing with education. But those things are coming. And if this b- this bill particularly is shelved until the end of session, it's because they want to deal with those types of issues before coming to a resolution on the gender-affirming care ban. So much remains to be seen. Very much so. Jason Rosenbaum is St. Louis Public Radio's political correspondent. You can read his latest reporting at stlonair.show. Jason, thanks again for being here with us today. Thank you. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.